No flexing, aim for progression. We cover news, politics, our forms, and entertainment that comes in all sources. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pittsburgh Current Podcast. I'm Pittsburgh Current Editor and Publisher Charlie Deitch, and um, it is the political season. Uh, you may have noticed that after the <laughs> the Iowa Circle jerk the other night and uh, the president's uh, acquittal. Um, so we're going to be doing a lot of politics on this show, talking to some folks who uh, want to get into office and want to change things. But first, I want to tell you about, I want to thank our sponsor, Jazz HR. Are you struggling to hire? Headquartered in the heart of Pittsburgh, Jazz HR helps you find and hire more qualified candidates faster than ever. JazzHR.com. That's ja- www.jazzhr.com. So our guest today is Emily Skopoff, c- candidate for 28th District State Rep Race. I'm talking very fast, I think, because I'm very excited because we all know that uh, Mike Terzai, the former Speaker of the of the State House, and uh, Nine-term um, Republican leader uh, has decided to retire after after nine terms. Um, and Emily, you ran against uh, Mike. Well, first of all, let me ask you this: You ran against Mike in the last election, came within ten points, which was no one had come. And, and well, let's t- let's break it all down and take it all slow. What was your reaction when you heard that Mike was resigning? And I'm sure you had heard the rumors. We'd all heard the rumors. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Sure. So I want to make sure to say that I'm I'm excited to be here, and it's a it's always n- nice to have a, a fun interview. Right. You know, you know it's going to be fun and thoughtful at the same time. Um, our reaction, we, we kind of, it was surreal. Mm-hmm. Uh, my campaign manager, who's sitting off to the side as well, we <laughs> we you know you, we'd heard the rumors for so sure. long that it was hard to believe it was really going to happen because you know in this business I think. So many things that feel like they should happen mm-hmm. don't. You know, things that logically might one might expect don't happen. Um, I mean, I wasn't shocked, but at this, on the one hand, because it, it makes sense, I think, right. the reasons that he's choosing to uh, not seek re-election. But we were, I mean, that, I think excited is an understatement. Mm-hmm. Um, we were we, we were pretty excited because we also, not just because it, it removed a large obstacle in the campaign for a number of reasons I'm sure we can talk about, but Mm -hmm. also, I mean, it, it got people so excited throughout that district and it validated what we knew. I mean, in a sense, he then by, by choosing not to run, he was acknowledging that this district is not what it was when he first got into office. And, and that's what we'd been saying the last time as well. And, and to me, this was our strongest indication that we've, we've been right and continue to be right. Right. And I think that we're seeing that, um, in races across the state. We've seen it a ton here in Southwest Pennsylvania. Um, uh, when Emily ran the first time uh, in a former life, I did. we did a uh, candidates forum, and it was yeah. a game show type format. And we had on the same dais, we had um, Sarah Inamorato, Summer Lee, and Emily. And it was sort of like one of these almost surreal moments because uh, obviously Sarah and Summer would go on to um, to win their races against two very entrenched Democrats in the primary. Um, but you were, of course, you were looking more at, you were already looking toward November at that point. Um, and I think that one of the things from that announcement that sort of, that struck me as, I don't know, maybe Sour Grapes, maybe maybe him, maybe Mike Terzai sort of taking a shot on the way out was, he basically said, you know, I'm doing this because it's time, not that he wasn't worried about, you know, any race in no, in November. He was, you know, and I'm sure you saw the comments and, yeah. you know, he kind of tried to poo poo the 10 points. But people have to understand the significance of the race you ran. Talk right. to me a little bit about that first race and what you learned. And again, you talked a little bit about why right. you went into it because you thought the district wanted something different. How did that bear out, and how was that first campaign? What did you learn from that first campaign? Well, I, I'm sort of going to go backwards yeah, to some please. of the things you said earlier, which is, you know, 
I, I do point out because we and I when I say we, I mean, make no mistake, this was not a me because mm -hmm. we could not have done what we did if it were not a, a we. And that was a district wide group of serious grassroots people and people who came in from outside the district because they felt this race was really, really right. critical to the future of Pennsylvania. But it was about eight and a half points. Not that anyone's <laughs> counting, although we are actually really counting because I mean, yeah. we fought for for every point. And so, you know, I saw some of the original, some of the initial comments by Republicans, such as, you know, you know, he, he, you know, crushed her by, you know, almost 10 points. I'm like, I'm sorry, but to come that close to mm -hmm. the Speaker of the House right. as a first time candidate, um, they should be trembling. Right. You know, how did how did we do that? And again, it wasn't just because we were magicians or we were special. It was that we tapped into the needs that were very real in that district mm -hmm. and that sentiment that they wanted something very different from what they'd been getting from Speaker Terzai for a number of years and were ready to just get behind somebody who was willing to do that work. Um, I mean, it was, it was really, it was really an inspiring thing to do. It was, you know, for me to run the last time, I just felt like I needed to be, I'm somebody who tends to do, I don't, I mean, I, anyone who knows me knows I do talk a lot, uh, but I'm a doer, you know, because I, uh, it's hard for me to not be doing something when I see something that needs to be, you know, solved or dealt with. And otherwise I feel like a hypocrite. Um, and so, but I realized it was really just, everybody had their part to play in this endeavor. You know, some people have different strengths. And so like, I might not be good at one part of mm -hmm. campaigning. I might be, you know, and I think for me, um, oddly, I make the parallel to the film industry where I also had to work against right. odds that were against me at the time. And this was all for a number of reasons. I, I had no family there. There was no nepotism there to be had for me. I had to learn a lot on my own. I had to help myself alone. I mean, I really had to work very, very hard and, and outwork everyone I knew to get ahead and also, frankly, not be afraid of being treated poorly. Right. You know, so when people would worry about me and say, oh, you know, Harrisburg is awful or, you know, how are you going to deal with that? I'm like, I. I survived, you know, over two decades in in the film industry and left right. with my soul, my decency and my integrity. Right. So to me, I, I kind of feel like I'm weirdly qualified from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Like I can take a punch. Right. I can take repeated punches when I know that what I'm doing is right and what matters. And we were so lucky The the committees in our in our district were so fired up. They were looking to take on a fight. They were right. looking for a challenge. They were, especially in that district, the Democrats wanted to get up and say, look, this was a red district. Right. It is not anymore, it is changing, and we're tired of feeling ignored or dismissed. Right. And the, all the assumptions, I mean, honestly, I would go outside the district and tell people I was running and sort of get a, that's nice. Mm -hmm. You know, because no one assumed, it, no, everyone really had assumed it was a foregone conclusion that a Democrat could not do well there. Right. And yet I thought, well, that doesn't really jive with like my everyday experience where I'm very active in the community. Right. So the district people would tell me about was not the district I felt like I lived in. Right. And I think that was a sentiment shared by a lot of the de the Democrats in that district, which was like, we are here. Like, why does people, you know, why do people, and then they thought, well, maybe we just need to be louder. Right. You know, not necessarily combative, but louder and be willing to say, look, we have issues. We have values. We need to see that we are an equal participant in any conversation that takes place about the future of this district. Yeah. And, you know, I always say I'm just a person with sort of a big mouth, you know, who's not afraid to stand up for things that, you know, I believe are right. And not everybody wants to put themselves out front like that. I don't and I don't judge them for that. That's just something I've always been able to do for better or worse is to, to speak up when I think it's important. Yeah. And I want to talk a little, about, a little bit more about that, but I want to go back to something that you mentioned and something that, excuse me, that through some research that I had been working on a story, and you and I were talking before we started, um, some things that I had been hearing and some people I've talked to, I think that, I think that, I think that Terzai, one of the, one, one, I, I will give him credit for this, a lot of people don't read the writing on the wall. And I think finally, and I don't think he's ever <laughs> read the writing on the wall until now, but through my experience and through my research um, from talking to folks, he was losing political clout in that district. Um, he was backing candidates that weren't getting elected to places like um, uh, municipal, uh, uh, you know, they were, he was losing borough elections where he currently right. had his people installed. And so 
I think it was the writing on the wall in terms of losing clout in the district. And then you add on to the fact that we've now seen through this will be the third election cycle where we're seeing turnover with entrenched incumbents are right. being matched up against um, uh, new 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 candidates who are bringing fresh ideas in a progressive way. And they're they're not faring well. And so and I think that that's the situation. That's why you have someone like Harry Reedshaw. And that's why we have so many um, retirements, <laughs> retirements or or going into yeah. witness protection, whatever you want to call it. But <laughs> but is it was that your experience? You mentioned that a little bit. But that was your experience, too. Where you were talking to the people in the community who said, you know, they were they were that, that vision. His vision wasn't their vision any longer. I you know, I don't even. It it wasn't just vision. I, right. I mean, really. The, so, you know, what I what I did when I decided, you know, to run mm -hmm. was, I mean, really it, instinctively and intuitively, not just really not for, as a political strategy, because I I, I am honestly a, a I would not make a good hypocrite. Um, I don't like I can't do something unless I really believe in right. it to a large extent, and so. I felt like what was needed is, you know, I don't want to sound all kumbaya and all of that, but really right. we need, it's a bipartisan community. You know, I live on streets where, you know, Republicans, independents, Democrats, we're friends, we're neighbors. So, you know, we need, if we can do that outside the political arena, why are we not doing it inside the political arena? And I said, I need to, to walk that walk. So I knocked on Republican doors for probably 20 months out of the 24 mm -hmm. months that I knocked doors. And it wasn't, it was to really say, look, I'm here because I may be running as a Democrat, mm -hmm. you know, for the, but I'm not running for their party. I'm running for the agenda that this district decides is what is important to right. them. And that's for Republicans, Democrats, independents, any, right. anybody. And what I heard frequently, I mean, truly with the most frequency of anything was, that they had not gotten a call back from Speaker Terzai. Right. They hadn't gotten a call back from his office. They Most people had never seen him. Some people weren't sure who he was. And, and I mean, there's a very select group that did know who he was, and that was originally the very active Republicans right. who were like, and I mean those who were on committees, um, and the very wealthy in that district. And other than that, people who couldn't do him a favor, it was my sense that or donate large mm -hmm. amounts were not getting real services from from him and that was incredibly telling that's and and it really just confirmed my belief so for me a lot of it i mean they you know whatever the the cliche is about you know half of life is showing up or whatever it is right. i mean people were just thrilled to have me on their doorstep you know just to have somebody say like i'm legitimately here um and i i mean much to the chagrin of some of my campaign staff yeah. i spent a long time at each door i mean i was not like super speedy and my numbers sure. you know sometimes i'd get yelled at by my field director <laughs> but but i also think that's why we did what we did because you can't rush sincerity right. you know you can't rush really listening and it yeah. more of my job was to listen than to tell them and so and once people started talking you know you you just you, you want to listen until they're done really yeah. saying what they have to say. And it was really, really invaluable. And more than anything, I mean, nobody there lives in an idealistic world that any politician or anyone who represents, you're representing a whole lot of people. You can't be 100 percent on 100 percent of the people's issues 100 percent of the time. Right. But what they want to know is, will you be thoughtful about whatever compromises you have to make? Will you be deliberate? Will you invite participation and comments and feedback and discussion. I mean, really, that's sort of all that they're looking mm -hmm. for. And to know that their needs and concerns are respected. Right. And it's so basic. Like, this is, it's very, very basic. I'm not saying the political strategy itself doesn't become sophisticated, but really the job should be, it's it's communication right. and concern and then being willing to, to work for that. And um, I think that's why we did as well as we did. There was a real hunger for that. And I think there's a hunger for that all across the country. And, um, you know, people are so cynical about politics for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I but I also think we want to do something to restore faith that the system, it may not be perfect, but can we do a better job? And can we get people in there who aren't already cynical? I mean, granted, I am a cynical person. I'm not going to say that, you know, I've learned that the hard way, but I also never stop striving for being better and i really think that's what people want they want to have some level of faith and trust in government right now and 
who does? You know, right. nobody does. And, right. and kids don't. And that's the saddest thing to me of all is that kids don't. So what in the world does the next generation look like if right. everyone's like, you know, to hell with this because everybody's corrupt? Yeah. So and, and I feel like especially at the local level, we really should be able to make a dent in that, you know, it, because pe- these are the people you see every day and at the supermarket and at school. If we can't convince them that we're trying to do our best and with dignity um, and integrity, then how how can we if we can't start from there i think we're lost right and i I don't i think a lot a lot of younger and you're a mother of two yes um i think that um i think a lot of a lot of a lot of kids uh, um younger folks probably would never think of the word dignity as they watch a lot of our political process these days so uh, how do you how do you talk to folks about um, how do you get folks? I know that when you start talking politics to people, they want to talk, you know, they have their spectrum of, of things they want to talk about. And, you know, someone may be mad at the way things are going in Washington and so forth. How do you work to really get uh, to get them talking about the issues? Or, or do you really do you really see that people care less about maybe the bigger stuff than they than than, than maybe we meaning journalists and media and so forth think they do and they care more about what's going on in their own backyard in, in these races well, I think that the issue some of the problem I guess is that the national stuff is loud right. you know it's volume it's on television all the time it's the front page of the papers and I mean now it's like louder than ever and it's crazy um, but I, I think that's why these campaigns are so critical right. the, the other thing is there's there's a big information education gap you know we all love to like bemoan oh they're not teaching civics in school and kids don't understand but a lot of people do not understand how much the local stuff impacts their daily lives and it's not because they're ignorant it's not because they don't care they're they're so busy and I don't want to get on any kind of soapbox about the but we are there's a constant onslaught of information right now Mm -hmm. all the time in a way there didn't used to be and how do you know what to listen to how do you know so it's you're here the stuff that's the loudest breaks through the stuff that has the most money to like get their messages out there breaks through. But that's why these campaigns are so important. And that's another reason I think we did so well because we had real grassroots people going to people's doors and you know, people would want to talk about the presidential or they assumed I'm showing up as a Democrat and I'm there to talk about Trump. I'm not right. there to, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about what's going on in, in Pennsylvania, what's going on in this district. And once you make that case, then they're happy to talk about it. Yeah. I think it's really just they're not used to feeling like there's anyone to listen to those issues um, and that they don't have a voice. And especially when you have these entrenched incumbents and look, Pennsylvania politics is, it enables cronyism. It enables corruption. Yeah, right. You know, our, our finance laws are, are the lack of a gift ban. They, they did the gerrymandering. Like we're not doing a whole lot right. to make people feel real good about their local, um, you know, political situation. And so that's why when you get grassroots people coming and saying, I agree with you. And I think we need to change that until we change some of these things. Why would people yeah. feel trust in that? But but that's how we the grassroots campaigns, I think, are really responsible for getting people to once again feel like it's worth caring about local issues. Yeah. I just think they didn't think they had a voice in that either. Right. Honestly, how do you handle the national discussion when you go door to door? Because. I think that in a district like yours, which is Republican and Democrat, it's a it's a very mixed district. Um, we had uh, in the last election cycle, for example, I mean, it's uh, someone like um, candidates like Connor Lamb and some others who were campaigning in districts like that. They sort of didn't want to talk about Trump, wouldn't talk about Trump. How do you address that when you go to the door and, and people if I'm sure you get those folks who want to talk about Trump, either plus or minus or they want to know where you stand on the president? How do you handle those kind of potential political landmines? Um, you know, it, it really it's it's sort of a case by case basis. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I certainly got Republicans who, if I show up at their door, they are immediately combative or defensive because they assume I'm going to be combative. Yeah, they assume I'm going to attack them and be judgmental. And when I'm not, they're usually very relieved. And then, you know, sometimes then they just want to talk about what they want to talk about. I had people who would say. I don't know if you want to talk to me because I support Trump. Sometimes I'd say, well, I'm not running against Trump, so right. it doesn't really matter. Right, <laughs> you know, exactly. like that, I'm not running against him. I'm running for local issues. And it's not really to dodge it because if, if they say to me, because sometimes I really just want to get into the local stuff. But if they really want to say, well, what do you think of Trump? I'm like, I, 
I will answer. I mean, I always answer honestly because I think people know when you're lying. Yeah. You know, and that's the worst thing I think you can do. I think it's you can certainly lie to them and tell them what they might want to hear. But I honestly think if they know you're, you're it's it's much better to just yeah. disagree with them. Um, and I will say, you know, I don't I don't like I don't it's not about the pol like we can take the policies aside. I still think this office requires dignity and decorum yeah. and a certain level of compassion and just a standard of conduct. Your conduct should be better than the average person's or that's what that job is. And right. that's, you know, I, it, it undermines all the policies in the world when you behave worse than we tell our kids to behave. <laughs> right, right. And so I don't even get, most people don't even want to get into the policies. And almost every time I say things like that, people will agree with me. I mean, they honestly, I don't like how he says what he says, but I'm like, I don't see a but. You know, like, mm -hmm. would you tell your kids it's okay to behave? Like, really ask yourself that every day. Could right. your boss behave that way? Could you behave like that at work? So there's there's that. And so that's a very simple thing that really most people don't disagree with. And I think they appreciate that even though they're a Republican, I'm willing to be critical. Um, and then there are some people who like that Trump was not a politician. And I'd say, well, neither am I. Right. And that actually, I mean, that's I had Trump supporters supporting my campaign because I'd say, look, I'm I'm not from this system either. And I think, I mean... I understand. I think I come at it from a different perspective, and and I bring my I will bring up my nonprofit, and that I work in nonprofits, and so I I'm able to I have a history now of working with all different people to serve the needs of others, and so I have that track record to bring with me to to Harrisburg, and largely, it really most people expected it to be rough. I guess it was in some ways with the Republicans, but I found that really a lot of it was when they saw you were not judgmental right. or combative, they were more than happy to to not have to put the gloves up and fight about yeah. it. Yeah, and people know when you're not listening, and people know when you're, you know, when you're when you're lying to people. I mean, I think that's what the, the thing with a lot of career politicians is either they don't they don't think that people know or they don't right. care that the people know right. but people know and that's they just want to be like you said they want to be treated with some level of dignity and with some some with some knowledge that you respect them and you respect their right. intelligence and intelligence and their views right so yeah. um we're going to take a quick break and we'll talk about Drusky Entertainment it's time to break out the ponchos the watermelon smashing phenom gallagher Brings his his hysterical prop comedy to Craft House Stage and Grill on Friday, February twenty first, with special guests Wolfie and Frank Perman. Get your tickets today at www.druskyent.com. That's www.druskyent.com. And if you have some questions for Emily Skopoff, um, write them in the comments, or you can email Jake at PittsburghCurrent.com, and we will uh, we'll get those on uh, out to Emily. Um, what is your what is your sort of legislative wish list as as you go for what what are the issues that are first and foremost to you um one of my top issues i i mean just if it's achievable really is i think we have to make sure that everything about our government is fair is as fair as possible and i think that that is you know it's things like the finance reform the fact that you know we give an absurd amount of money and unlimited funds to to candidates i think you know we have to fix gerrymandering mm -hmm. anything that really allows our elections to be fairer freer to make sure that our districting process is, is not a political process um, because otherwise nothing else really matters we have to be able to have real representation with things like gerrymandering and when right. you know when there's voter suppression um whether it's you know really obvious or subtle it doesn't matter then we don't have fair representation yeah. you can't even accurate you really can then represent the will of the people which still at the end of the day is really is it's the not the will of the legislator it's the will of the people that you're supposed to represent so um those that i think is is really critical i think public edu public education which was one of my main reasons for wanting to run against uh, Mr. Terzai is, is, I mean, our record on education in Pennsylvania is, is really shameful. Yeah. We have just chronically underfunded public education. And if you do not have educated children, if all of our children, if we are not investing in all of our children in an equitable way and giving them the tools to succeed, we are already 
dooming our future to failure. You know, that's sort of where I think the whole state goes. And and I really think that goes across the board. If children, if our children are not well equipped with, you know, the appropriate health care and they can't live, you know, healthy, successful lives and can't have access to the tools that they need to better themselves um, or, you know, and find opportunities, you know, that's that's a really terrible like our future is is looking bleak right. let's put it that way and i think we have to make sure we stop taking you know public dollars putting them into private education i think we really have to look at how we fund public education yeah. um the property tax problem everyone talks about it and, and not a whole lot gets done but i've seen right. some really interesting ideas um i think you know another issue that we have is the economy that's really critical we we have to make sure that we are job creators but what i found when you look at someone like you know my former opponent mr Terzai, it's we're offering incentives to the same industries over and over right. and over. And to me, that's not, you know, and you're helping the businesses, not the workers. Why are we not trying to diversify? I mean, this is, if you really want to be good in your economics, you have to diversify your whole portfolio. Yeah. And I think we should be, if you look at the energy sector, for example, you know, people complain about oil and gas and rightfully so there are issues with that, but why are, why isn't the state doing more to help alternatives and the green infrastructure right. and also those could be union jobs as well. So I am a big supporter of um, organized labor. I think workers should be able to organize. I think they really need to be able to do that and to protect themselves and have safe workplaces. And, you know, we want skilled workers on a lot of these sites. So I think our unions have played a really critical role in building Pennsylvania. Um, but we could also be bringing in, you know, green energy jobs. And I think we could also be doing better on safety in some of the jobs that we have and, and just even implementing um, – safe operations would create more union labor so we are missing the boat on a whole bunch of things you know we're missing the boat i think on the severance tax yeah um i think the impact fee was sort of a compromise right. that has put us in a bad position i think there should have been let, a, a let me just tax. ask you about the yeah. severance tax real quick because that's something that's what is what is i mean pennsylvania seems to have a problem in doing things that other states have done a lot larger than 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 we have done and the severance tax seems to be one of those things what yeah. what it's hard for me, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's hard for me to think that there's little more than campaign contributions keeping a severance tax from coming to Pennsylvania. Yeah, so that's my that's largely my take. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, that they've a lot of people in leadership have been bought by the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. um, now, look, oil and gas have been tremendous for Pennsylvania. So it, it, that's that's great. But on the other hand, but we have the assets here, yeah. they're not going to leave if we get a severance tax. I mean, because this is where it is. This right. is where the business is. So it's absurd. Um, I think, and also then there are people who just believe, and, and this sort of goes to the trickle-down economics idea, which is <laughs> if we have these businesses yeah. that flourish and we give them all this stuff and they don't pay their fair share, but somehow that will actually help workers and families. And the, that's not true. Right. I mean, like, it's just not true. And it has been borne out over years it does not reach the middle class. It doesn't reach the working class. So it, it makes absolutely no sense, and I don't know why they refuse to see it except perhaps for being blinded by right. this idea. I mean, I think we need to really enable our, our working families and the working class and the middle class because that's how you really grow the economy. And when you provide incentives for a whole range of businesses to come here, you know, that's when you can make this an appealing, really multifaceted economy that really is sustainable. There's no... There's no reason why we should continue to give handouts over and over yeah. and over. Let's find other ways. There, there are plenty of other ways to create union jobs, not just by giving sweetheart deals right. to some of those industry players. And also, I think they would come here anyway. Um, yeah. So we're like giving away the farm. Right. And it's. I really think it's mostly because they've been bought by and pressured by lobbyists right. and campaign contributions yeah i mean when you when you have the assets they want you, you you have the gas whether again there's all sides of that issue in terms of whether we should be going after it at all but you have it and so they're not gonna you know they're not gonna it's not gonna be a competitive bid process between you and another state because they don't right. have what they need and right. so we do tend to give things away um and and i the the incentives and not severance tax but also the incentives given to uh the the cracker plant in beaver it's one of those things that i i still don't believe that that once a lot of those construction jobs goes go construction jobs go away i don't really think that they're ever going to be able to be worth the the package that they were given by no that i mean governor. Th that's 
you know, I've looked at some of the numbers recently mm -hmm. and spoke to uh, someone else yesterday. I mean, at the end of the day, the jobs, I think, might even be as little as two to 300 jobs. Yeah. Um, that's a whole lot of money that went to end up with those few jobs. But I also think part of the problem with, for example, you know, the cracker plant is that also we didn't insist on, and this is why the turn, you know, the, the tide of public opinion now for all the great things that oil and gas has done right. for the economy and we can, and for our, our workers and all of that, why did we not enforce stricter compliance? Why did we not ensure that they were using the best possible, possible yeah. safety regulations? So this is how we've, we've gotten ourselves into this thing by, by really just rolling over. You know, and not just saying, like, you know, if you're going to come here and do business, you know, it's not good for the workers either. Right. Like, that's the thing. You're really hurting everybody except the business owners. At the end of the day, the people who are working should be working in the safest possible environments. And we should be insisting that if we're going to give you things, what are we getting back? Right. Besides jobs, especially jobs where people could get hurt or find out years later that, you know, they've got an illness because they were working in an right. unsafe, hazardous environment. So we have to watch out for our people as well. And I, I don't think... Job creation it, on its own is not enough. We have to do a better job right. with the job creation and, and how we look at that. And I do think we have been giving too much away for, for too long. And I think um, we can do a much better job than, than we've been. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to fathom that we've done so much and continue to want to do stuff. Let's do it also for then solar and energy and, right. you know, for solar and wind and, and, and I mean, frankly, and nuclear. Why are we not incentivizing those kinds right. of those really those energy sectors? And we could insist on union labor. If you're let's unionize, let's have alternative energy companies unionize and have unionized labor. So um, there, there are just ways to do things that I, I'm sure they're being talked about. I am not a genius. Right. Um, and so, and my kids will later quote me on saying that out <laughs> loud that I am not a genius. Um, so you're welcome children. Um, but it's just leadership is standing in the way and like anything, it comes down to power and money. Right. And that's what I think we're seeing right now at all levels of government. Um, Women's reproductive health, I know, is another issue that, um, number one, it's a huge issue in this state. And um, it doesn't seem as though, I mean, there is still a lot of work going on. I think, I don't want to say behind the scenes because those that are paying attention obviously know some of these pieces of legislation. But, you know, it does, it, it, I think people sometimes tend to forget about it a little bit because it was so, the, the legislation that was proposed and also enacted probably four or five years ago, six years ago, it was so major, it caused a stir, it caused an uproar. But there's still an attack on women's, uh, women's health, re women's reproductive rights going on in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I assume, <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was not a, what if it's Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah that yeah, wasn't a question. But yeah. that's something I know that you have, you are also uh, right. concerned about and work uh, Well, certainly given my opponent's position, which yeah. could not be more extreme. Um, yeah. And I also, I just think it's incredibly hypocritical to talk about small government, but what they don't say is small government when it's convenient. Right. Um, you know, if you're going to, you know, government overreach that reaches into my body is, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. You know, and, and so if we had the same thing for men, I think there wouldn't even be a conversation. You know, nobody tells right. men what to do with their bodies. Why right. is, you know, it's, it's really... A lot of it is a health issue. I mean, if you want to look at Planned Parenthood and some of those other organizations, the majority of people going there are really going for basic health care. Yeah. It is just basic, basic health care. Um, but I just think, you know, the, the very slippery slope of where this all goes is, you know, I don't want to say Handmaid's Tale, but really, you know, it, it really devalues what a woman is sure. beyond an incubator right you know right. and again i'm someone who has two kids would have liked to have had more kids so it's it's not about that it's just i don't think it's right and truthfully what one of my biggest issues with some of the folks who say they're pro-life is they're pro-birth you know and i would love to see you know what are you doing to support people who find themselves pregnant who have serious economic hardships who haven't been able to c complete their education are you helping them to in fact become a parent, if you're not, then honestly, you really shouldn't have a say. Right. Because until you're going to be willing to say, we're going to help that family that, you know, nobody wants to make that choice. I think it's an absurd thing to think people capriciously um, would choose to have an abortion. I think most people do it when it's, now I'm not saying all, but most people do it 
it, it's not right. It's not a good time for them. What is anybody doing it to make it a better time for them to have a child right. um, and to raise that child un- when they otherwise might be in difficult circumstances? So the, the pro-life movement, I really think they need to look at the whole life of that child, not just the birth, because then they turn their backs on it. And the same people who are pro-life are, are taking away things from struggling families every single day. Yeah. So, I mean, really, that is the height of hypocrisy to me. And it's, and it's unethical, actually. I want to talk a little bit about your opponent. But first, I do want to talk about, I want to thank again our sponsor, Jazz HR. Are you struggling to hire? Headquartered in the heart of Pittsburgh, Jazz HR helps you find and hire more qualified candidates faster than ever. With plans starting as low as $39 a month and including best-in-class recruitment tools like interview self-scheduling and candidate texting, Jazz HR is the easiest and most affordable solution to finding your next great hire. Post your job for free today at jazzhr.com. That's www.jazzhr.com. Um, probably within, I think, 24 hours of announcing his retirement, um, uh, Representative Terzai also then backed um, a candidate uh, that he would like to see, a Republican candidate who he would like to see take his spot, and that is um, uh, Robbie Curie, who has been around. Uh, he's a uh, Republican who's sort of been around uh, the political scene as far as I think for Republicans anyway. He's, he's certainly been in that. Um, what do you know? What do you know about your opponent, and, and does it change the way that you're going to approach this race? You know, if I had, I mean, I don't know much more than. Well, I live in the district, obviously, so I I hear things in the district. I know that he was not that active in my understanding within, and and again, I'm saying my understanding, so I may be wrong. What I am hearing, even from Republicans in the district, a lot of them were caught a little off guard by Mm. this and did not know him very well. So I think they found that problematic. I know there were some prominent Republicans who've been very active in the district who I think wanted to perhaps think about putting their hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. And felt like this took the like pulled the rug out from under them. I'll throw in some more cliches and other you know things like that. But the but um, so that was I think surprising, and there was some frustration. That's what I'm hearing. But what I do know, and and where we had thought about, I mean, look, he's a Bronze Star veteran. I mean, no one yeah, can take that sure. away, and it's incredibly impressive. He went to West Point, um, also very impressive. Clearly, a, a very smart man, and and from all appearances, a, a family man, um, and someone with honor. But I will say, you know, some of the f- statements he's already made is that he looks forward to continuing Terzai's policies. Right. Um, and so there's really, in that sense, I'm not running against an entrenched incumbent, but I am running against those very same policies that yeah. I find are incredibly problematic. On a personal level, I find them problematic because I don't agree with them, but I also find them problematic because that's not what that district is anymore. I right. don't think that those values are representative of the majority of people in that district. And so I just think it's it's off it's off key. It's a little tone deaf to what that district is becoming. And look, Representative Terz, I knew to leave um, right. because it just, again, maybe at one time he was truly representative of the people who live there. And that is no longer true. So to put someone in who is essentially using the same platform right. um, and also who, you know, my understanding from his about his work at PNC as a risk management, you know, he does risk management is mostly it's managing the oil and gas assets that they have there, which I believe are almost three billion. Mm -hmm. So we have another person who is potentially there just to defend the oil and gas companies. And I want to be clear, it's the oil and gas companies, not the industry or the workers, because for me, I also want to protect the people who work in that industry. It's not just about the companies. It's really about the people who work in it and the people mm-hmm. who are affected by it. So one has to question a little bit why that choice. I mean, the, the ties to oil and gas, it, from that point of view, there's a lot of money at stake yeah. for, for PNC. And so maybe this is also their guy getting out there and, and trying to protect their stuff because we all know the gas industry is, is taking a hit right now and uh, everything's being devalued and I'm sure they're concerned. Sure. And and one of the things I think that people maybe were willing as the district changed, uh, as you as you talk about, as the district sort of changes its philosophy. It's not the same district that Mike Terzai first ran for, obviously. 
But I think a little bit of the appeal there at least was the fact that that district could say, oh, we have the Speaker of the House as a right. representative. You're, you know, you're not going to just to be clear. <laughs> right. And the, the, the winner of this race is not going to become the Speaker of the House. So yes. you're going to have you're going to you have somebody who's going to come in with Mike Terzai's policies, if you don't believe uh, if you if you don't, uh, you know, uh, prescribe to his his way of thinking, which, of course, I know a lot of us don't, um, you know, you're going to basically have. Mike Terzai or Mike Terzai light, but probably Mike Terzai without the political clout. And, and I, so at that point, I'm not sure that that even can be considered a, a, a plus for someone, especially you said in a district that's changing as much as the 28th is. Well, that's our feeling. I mean, that is, that is certainly our feeling. And, you know, when running and again, as the speaker, when people would say, well, you know, it's, it is kind of nice having the speaker. I recall having this conversation with someone and I'd say, well, tell me, Okay, I hear you. So, th- and in theory, yes, that should be the case. What has he done for you or this district that you feel any representative right. could not have done? I mean, some of the things that were recently just done um, by Senator Lindsey Williams. You right. know, a, you know, really someone new to the Senate yeah. who's brought back a lot of money to our district, and Terzai, I believe, was trying to take some of the credit for some of that. But I did not see any indication that we got the benefit of right. having the speaker in our district and and no one did honestly. Right. And that's that's very important to to note is that Lindsay Williams has brought a ton of money back to the district um in her first term right. as as a state senator. And so yeah, that's uh, that's that's an excellent point. And because we get press releases it seems like every 10 days from Lindsay's office saying she's, we're she's bringing actually back this, doing bringing the back. job. Yeah, absolutely. She's, she's she's busy, she's working with both parties and she's really trying to do a job for the people of her district which is really what the job should be, whereas, you know, I saw Terzai put in a sidewalk right before election time so he could put it on his mailers. You know, it was so desperately needed, <laughs> right. but really you couldn't right. do it up until now. So I just think he really only did the bare minimum of what he felt was politically expedient. Mm-hmm. Um, so just sort of, I guess, looking back at your first campaign and now into the second as we sort of wrap up here, what kind of things did you learn then that you're now doing differently now? And, and um how has that experience shaped this this time this go around is there much is are you are you doing much different are you that's a you know i i do i i suppose it has evolved um into i i dare use the word sophisticated because i don't think most people associate that word with with me typically or my campaign (laughs) anyone who's been in our offices i mean we we work very hard uh we're you know we we have a lot of passion for what we do I think some of it is really just learning not to get pulled in the, you know, you can't tap dance for everybody. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of, I think what I've learned is sometimes knowing when I, you want to be accommodating, you want to, um, you want to be responsive, but sometimes I think people, it's not really what they want to know. Sometimes it's, it's, you get the sense that you're getting roped into conversations so people can feel important about Mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's really almost like a trap. Like they're looking not just for the gotcha moment, but I also think there's there's a sense that I I I mean honestly I had seen myself as someone before as just the voice of I don't want to say a movement, but really, again I always say I'm the person with the big mouth. So if someone has to say something difficult, I'm happy to do yeah. it because just I've always been that person. Um, but I realize there is you you do need to be a leader. You know you do have to, and that's more than just having a big mouth. Right. You know it's it's being willing to willing really willing to make the difficult decisions and when you know and learning to trust your instinct you know that i think really more than anything that is the biggest difference is that you know i was told a lot of different things last time around when people bothered to talk to me at all because there were a lot of people who just were so dismissive of this race Mm -hmm. um until fairly late in the game um and so but I got a lot of bad advice from people really whose experience would have made me think that maybe they do know better than I do. Right. But I learned pretty quick that I, I have to trust my instincts. I have to trust my judgment. Right. And I have to trust, you know, I have some key people around me that have always, you know, I've learned who has led me astray and who has not. Right. And who will tell me the truth when I need. And I need people around me who will tell me the truth. Um, and I think that's been the the biggest thing is learning that, you know, maybe I'm not. I kept hearing I'm not a politician. I don't have all these things. But it doesn't mean I don't, you know, I don't understand things. And, I, and frankly, I think it's better that I'm not a career politician. I think right. I have a much better 
I'm not so insular, I'm not so myopic in the way that I look at things. I can look at them still as a citizen um, every day and someone who lives in that district. But it is learning, like, what is, I, I've learned that my gut feeling to, about things is often, and my feelings are what the my neighbor feels and someone else feels, and I, I would hate to lose that. And also learning to trust it. I mean, I, I can't spend the rest of my life second guessing or, or because then you can't move forward at all. You're paralyzed by that. Right. So, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but at least I'm trying to be truthful to what I thought was, was the right thing and the, and the right move. Right. And I, I totally, uh, just to, to finish here, I meant to ask you this earlier and it, cause it seemed to fit better earlier, but um, yeah. what was the decision to do this again? Because it was, I mean, I mean, that was your, your first campaign again, I'm sure it was, it was a learning experience. It was also a very different experience, but I'm sure you also learned that it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Yeah. So what, what was the final, I guess the decision maker for you was why you decided you wanted to do this again. And when it was even, it was Mike Terzai. So you knew, you know, you knew who you were going right. up against at that point. Right. I, I mean, honestly, after, you know, we didn't win last time, obviously. And, but we came, they can they can frame it however they want. I believe we came so close, sure. but also because I know what we went through, and sort of the lack of resources we had for a lot of the campaign. So really, it's it's sort of a miracle we did as well as we did. Right. Um, I kind of felt like how do we how do we not run again? I mean, I felt that very immediately mm -hmm. after yeah. the race. You know, once I'd slept a little, you know, <laughs> um, and spent a little time with my family. But I kind yeah. of thought how like I felt like we were almost just like hitting our stride. Mm -hmm. I mean, and not just us, like our committees, our, our volunteers, everyone there like had really started gelling to have a really good rhythm and a pace and an understanding. And we had made such inroads in that district. We had gotten people to be so excited about this campaign that showed we didn't have to keep accepting this really lame sort of form of representation yeah. if you could even faux representation um that we really and that's what i found too is in the months after because you know initially i was like of course we have to do this again what a waste of an effort if we don't because to get that close and then walk away felt it, it just felt wrong i mean just felt wrong especially given if look if, if mike terzai had turned around and changed the way he did things right like i wasn't running because i have this burning need right. to just be a politician I was running because I don't like what is being done in Harrisburg. Right. I don't like what's being done by our representative. I don't like the policies that I see. I want to be part of changing that. If he had changed what he right. was doing, a great I, point. I always say, like, I could have stayed, like, I would have spent more time with my kids. <laughs> great. You know, yeah. like, that was like, I'll have my life back. But it, but he didn't. Yeah. I mean, he continued the same. And, and Harrisburg, you know, still a battle to right. get to get anything done, right. frankly, let alone good things. Um, that's... I mean, especially critical things like if we're going to keep dropping the ball on public education, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't we have no hope. Like, so my thing was really let's keep running. And then the more I spoke to people around the district, including Republicans, frankly, the most who would say, like, we had no idea. Like, they really said more or less we didn't pay as much attention to your race because we thought, of course, he was just going to like, you know, 35 points. Right. Then they thought, wow, like, honestly, we're not really fans of the job he does either. But we right. never thought you could. Like we didn't know. Right. And so that's what really inspired me to realize like I I can't walk away. And I felt even for all the volunteers and the people who put on all those hours, all right, so it's a four year campaign instead. I mean, but if we get it done, that's the most important right. thing because we still need people in that legislature who want to work, I think, for the good of all Pennsylvanians and not for a very select few who continue to actually do well at the expense of everybody else um and if we keep doing that pennsylvania itself we're not going to bring new people in. we're not going to retain good people i think it's really critical that we start having a a more equitable government that really does create quality of life and opportunities for every single person mm -hmm. um the wealthy are going to be wealthier they're going to do well anyway but they would be doing better actually if the rest of everybody else also did well right. and i firmly believe that and i think a lot of them do too i just think we have too many people who are afraid to work to that end and so i i think it's really important we get more people in office who um who are willing to to fight that fight right emily scopoff thank you very much democratic candidate for district 28 district 28 um thank you for joining us and thank you for uh speaking candidly with us about your upcoming uh, the upcoming race Great. Thank you very this much. This has been the Pittsburgh Current Podcast. We will see you again next Thursday, and the new issue of the Pittsburgh Current will be out on stands on Tuesday. Thanks for joining us. See
<laughs> extra, extra, reading the issue. Raw news, unapologetic, no tissue. Catch the way, the flow for certain. Nothing put you in like a Pittsburgh current. Free from influence, nothing less than. No flexing, aim for aggression. We cover news, politics, all forms. And entertainment that comes in all sources.